Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Anyway, um, so going into 2009, uh, we we talked about um, live at the Square and KGW, and mm-hmm. we'll we'll see how that goes. I think I still think there's a ways. They have uh, quite a ways I to go. I think they have some momentum as, as far built as, up, though. Yeah. What uh, What do we see in 2009 as far as the so uh, you know Twitter really came into its own and, and keeps the community going. Mm-hmm. Do we see that uh, continuing? Uh, in 09 um, are there going to be is Identica going to come into play Um, I don't you you know that's a good question I think you know Twitter this year had uh, some downs and then kind of ended the year on and up you know there was mid-year there where we all really all of us who were already on there were fairly frustrated with Twitter and it's uptime and it's crashing and that sort of thing. But, you know, it, as it as it ramped up for the elections and dealt with that and, you know, throughout the end of the year, they've been pretty solid. So um, it, I, I, think that, I think they're just going to continue. We're just barely seeing um, mainstream adoption of Twitter. I mean, like, you're starting to see celeb- celebrities get on there. Um, Shaquille O'Neal is a good example that jumps to mind. Um, Tina Fey. Uh, you're, you're starting to see people who are, you know, household names using the tool, but still few of them. And the interesting thing was, and I, I tweeted about this too, but um, I thought I'd mention it, is that in watching the way that... Uh, PDX Twitter Storm Team, the PDX TST hashtag hash- mm-hmm. got it got adapted throughout the storm. I mean, KGW was using it. Um, other, you know, other folks were. I was finding people in Portland, who, you know, I try and follow a lot of Portland people on Twitter just to keep an, you know, keep a finger on the pulse of what's going on. And I was getting introduced to so many new Twitter users simply because of that tag that, you know that uh, Verso and, you know, a couple other people kind of came up with on a whim when we were joking about rain or, you know, a snowflake falling <laughs> last last winter and trying to make a big deal out of it. And now suddenly it's it's commonplace for Portland. That's how you pay, att- that's how you pay attention to the weather mm-hmm. in Portland now. And that's where I was checking for road conditions. I wasn't going to ODOT. I was going to Twitter and searching on, you know, PDX TST to see what what my driving conditions were going to be like. So I think you'll continue to see those kind of things happening. But whether Twitter can continue to scale to support those um, is questionable. But I do, um, you know, I'm also kind of high on Twitter because they, they finally... Um, hired Rail Dornfest from here mm-hmm. in Portland, um, you know, acquired his company. Unfortunately, they shut it down, uh, shut down his products, but hopefully those have a chance to come back at some point. But I, I Rail is, you know, uber intelligent guy, and Twitter's lucky to have him, and I can't, I can't think of them doing anything um, but good work with him on staff, especially he'll be thinking about some of the some of the usability issues and and some of the user interface issues and those kind of things. So I think you'll see Twitter getting easier and easier to work with with him working on it. Let me let me ask you a Twitter related question. You had a really big problem earlier in the year with the number of people you were allowed to follow. Yeah. Is that solved? Okay. Uh, no, no, it's not solved. It's just I happen to um, there's a there's an algorithm in place that says uh, due to the spammers who would follow like ten thousand people um, or you know or twenty thousand people and then try and send them messages. It's basically there's an algorithm in place that says you can only follow plus or minus ten percent. Wait. Down to down to, uh, it's like t- within ten percent of the number of people you're who are following you, is what is what you're allowed to follow now. So if you're following two thousand people, if two thousand people are following you, you can follow twenty two hundred, but you can't follow any more than that. So, um, and the number the the gauge is two thousand. That's the that's the break point. So that's still not solved. That's still a gating mechanism that they have in place. 
I just happened to whine enough or beg enough that I got enough followers to continue adding people now. But I'm sure I'll hit that cap again because I kind of got out of the habit of adding people. Yeah. So uh, it's still a problem. I'd still like to, you know, as I've said several times, I would pay to remove that cap. I'd be willing to pay a subscription to get rid of that cap because I get so much value out of Twitter. I mean, I think I use it in a different way because I use it more like a newswire yeah. uh, to pay attention to what's going on. But um, yeah, that's still a problem. I think uh, Amber Case, Case Organic, just ran into that cap issue as well. There were a couple other people I heard about recently who just ran into that. But yeah, that's something they got to fix or figure out how they're going to work around. So we'll, we'll uh, you know, I mean, in 2009, uh, Twitter probably needs to start making some money. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you would think. Yeah. I mean, they're they're funded by they've they've got good funding, and you know, it, it, the other thing is the you know the uh, conspiracy side of me says Twitter is already making money <laughs> based on based on kind of aggregated anonymous data. You can't tell me they're not selling reports to major companies about what people are tweeting about on a regular basis. And I think there may already be some revenue moving around there, but they need to figure out a way to to really make some money and make it work. And they probably have a better chance, you know, quite honestly, than some of the other social networks with bloated, um, you know, kind of bloated valuations. It's and, just so you know, streamlined. Pure, yeah, purely well, I'm purely advertising based. I think Twitter has some other options. Like I don't think, I don't think if Dig, for example, which has been suffering as the ad market softened, um, I don't think Dig could go to a subscription model as easily as something like Twitter or Facebook, um, just because it, it it's just a different kind of usage of that tool. So I I'm still feeling pretty pretty positive about Twitter, especially since they've, you know, they've fixed the uptime and, and just, I simply get so much, I, I constantly find different ways to use it that are helping me out. So I still like that, but I still like Identica and those kind of ideas too. I think, I think those, you know, especially the idea of federated, which um, I think we've talked about before, but the, the idea that there isn't any one server that you have to hit to use Identica, you could have a, like Dom P, Dom P, I know, had a local instance of Identica running where you could feasibly log, you know, use that Identica server and still communicate with everybody on every other Identica server, much like email. Um, and that, that distributed system makes a lot more sense than the kind of single server thing that Twitter has going. But, you know, I think they, could, they kind of had their window of opportunity while while Twitter was kind of on its knees and they didn't really they didn't really take advantage of it and then Twitter fixed those issues. So, so I don't if, know. if Twitter did go to a subscription based model. Yeah. What would you be willing to pay? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean to me it's a it, it's unfair to me cuz I it's a business expense yeah. for me. I mean it's it um it, I I don't know. That's a you know, I don't know. Two hundred dollars okay. a year. Uh, Ooh, you'd pay more than I would. <laughs> yeah, you have. Yeah, because I you use said it, it's a business. I expense. use it differently. I mean, it's well, and that's the question. I, use it I all guess the, the time. question would be, yeah. um, if if people started dropping off it because it required a subscription, would I still get the same value out of it? Probably not. So that would probably determine it one way or the other. But. All right, so let's move on to your Nostradamus blog post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you Jeez, asked, did you read? Did you read Ed Baraski's? Yes, I did. I tweeted. Did. I tweeted the link to his post. E, that was awesome. Yes, yes, it was. I, I made. I printed it. I made a printout even so that Doctor Norman yeah. could look at it during. Yeah, the thanks, show. Ed. I'm sure Ed's in the chat room. So thank you, Ed. That was that was an amazing post. Yeah, we, go ahead. Yeah, I was. Just, I was. You know, I didn't. Uh, we got a lot of good feedback mm -hmm. on the, um, you know, that's what I was hoping. Mike and I had great, uh, excuse me, Dr. Normal and I had great plans for, you know, <laughs> what we were going to do for this thing. And once the weather hit, like, 
the plans went south with that. Were you going to wear a and, turban and hold the envelope up to your forehead? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh. I can't make jokes. The great Tarosi. You should talk about UFO and I can't make... <laughs> a martini, a Yugo, and a hooker. A martini, a Yugo, and a hooker. Yes. Okay. Yes. What's in that envelope? <laughs> Uh, to play us out, Doc. Um, so, so yeah. <laughs> sorry no, about I, that. I, and moving I, on to 2009 yeah. in technology. No, we're right, talking so about I, the the re- reactions to the post because yeah. So I, I just I favorites. you know kind of punted and said, well, let's let's at least solicit some opinions on what's going on. And you know, I got some great responses. I was trying to pull out some themes, and I think the most prevalent one for, uh, throughout kind of most of the comments was the mobile space will continue to kind of grow here mm-hmm. in Portland. I think that's easily, um, you know, I already mentioned uh, air sharing by Avatron up in Vancouver and there's, uh, and field runners by uh, subatomic studios here in Portland. There was the Obama app mm-hmm. that um, cloud the cloud four team and Raven Zachary were involved in that was, you know, the, this social app for for people to uh, to convince others to vote for Obama, and um, that was an amazing development. That was just a beautiful application. I was really impressed with the um, it worked well, but the design was phenomenal, and I thought they did a really good job there. Uh, there continue to be you know uh, there's a whole, there's a whole Android group here in Portland that's kind of following the Android development. Um, the mobile scene is going to continue to grow in Portland, both from a, I think from kind of like the geo geeking kind of stuff, you know, like the geolocation, where am I, what am I doing kind of stuff, as well as just the, the mobile handset has now become your computer by and large. I mean, I know you guys are huge iPhone users and, and so am I. And it would be unfair to say that we're huge iPhone users. I wake up with my iPhone in my hand every morning. <laughs> and huge it, does and it, not begin to describe A little describe bit more it. than our audience <laughs> needs to know, Cammie. Thank you. <laughs> but I mean, it's changed the way, I mean, for many people, and I know that business people have been this way with their Blackberries for Absolutely. years. Absolutely. And right? the trios before that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I used to have the Palm VX that, mm-hmm. uh, or 5X or whatever you call it, but I loved that thing and I would use that all the time. And I think it's, you know, this kind of always accessible platform that is intelligent enough to know where you are and provide that that chunk of data to help you access other things or you know tell other people where you oh, are or whatever so, like so a, we're early adopters um and and several people i think in the tech scene are early adopters in mobile but i think mm-hmm. the big news of the last year is you know the consumerism of the iphone the fact that it's apple the fact that apple does consumer electronics so well and that the iphone really ushered in a new era of the average user um starting to experience the the mobile web whereas uh you know early adopters or business people were more used to their blackberries or their um Palm trios and and the rest of the users were using like Motorola razors. I would go. I would go even further though, and I would say not only is iPhone fantastic for that, but I think that the iPhone and the iPod have been advertising for Mac's entire line of products. I would never have purchased a MacBook if it weren't for the fact that I had an iPhone. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, I was going to say that um, it really those other like when you think of the BlackBerry or the the Palm, they were really just supplanting another use case that you already had. Like, you you already did email, you just now happened to do it on a handheld. Or exactly. you already managed contacts, you just happened to do it on a handheld. And they'd kind of try and push other it, things. It, with with there, a but, reduced user experience. Right, but it wasn't, yeah. you weren't introducing something new. And what I think is so amazing about the iPhone and Android as well, because they're very similar in this regard, is they've introduced new functionality because of the the type of the type of hardware 
functions that they have there, like GPS and those sorts of things. They're they're starting to teach people to use things in different ways. And the the app I always reference um, that just always it always blows my mind, and I can't you know. Um, I can't say enough about it. It's not a terribly useful app. I just think it's really interesting. It's Ocarina. Have you guys ever played with that uh, app before? We had Craig on the show last week. Craig from Craig yeah, yeah, yeah. And he yeah. played the Ocarina for us. Yeah, that thing is awesome, and it uses all of the hardware functionality available in the iPhone. It uses the, you know, the speaker for I you to was blow into. It uses by the touch blowing screen. into. Yeah. Uses the GPS to broadcast, you know, here's so and so in Seoul, Korea playing a song, here's so and so in St. Paul, Minnesota playing, you know, it, it, um, it uses the entire functional, um, hardware of the, of the iPhone to build a ancient woodwind instrument, which is kind of weird, but it's still like using everything there. And that was the first app that I saw that I really kind of had this moment where I was like, wow, this is a totally different platform than anything we've dealt with before. And I think we'll continue to see people developing um, applications that mix and match the, this kind of functionality in different ways that are, and I think people in Portland are going to be doing that. I think that, you know, we're going to, that's going to be part of the core of what's going on. And we'll continue to see mobile development here kind of grow and prosper. Is it, um, and, and the reason you think that this is a, a sweet spot for, for Portland, Oregon, is because um, of the open source angle um, for mobile applications just in general? Um, I think on an Android side, I think we definitely got the open source community to kind of manage that. You know, I really don't know what it is from the, you know, the iPhone side of things. Like, I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really know how to gauge the popularity there, and well, I don't know that said we've it's a Coco app, which is uh, some sort of Java type language. I don't know. I'm not a programmer, so right. And there was there was also um, there was also Go Life Mobile here in town. They're also a, a mobile development outfit that they have a Java um, kind of a Java operating system, for lack of a better term, that allows people to write, you know, like Java's always promised on the desktop, to write one application and run it on any number of smart or dumb handsets. So um, there's just a, there's, I think there's just some momentum in terms of mobile here. And I'm really interested to talk to some other, I'm hoping to get the chance to talk to some other people in other cities to see if they're seeing the same thing or if this is something that's unique to Portland. We just had so many, we just had these apps that, you know, like the Obama app and, and the Field Runner and, and the ones that I mentioned, air sharing, that have taken on such an international presence that I have to think we've got something special. I, I think here. I think that Portland, it sounds like Portland's set up well for um the type of mobile ap activities that we'll see in 2009. But it seems to me, from what I've read, and I'm sure you've read as well, that mobile is a big theme on everyone's uh, radar yeah. for 2009, that it's just very much... And it's not just it's not just the software, it's the hardware, right? If you look right. at um, what's happening in the hardware space, a lot of it's... Well, and I was, mobile. I was trying to think of a... Uh, an analogy because I'm forever trying to force fit things into analogies and and the kind of phone development stuff kind of strikes me as like the indie music scene right now like that with the way the models built and that um, you know that you can get these you can get these apps for lo low barrier to entry for the apps even if you're buying them um, you know it's a it's a cheap yeah. ticket to see a really killer indie band um, at your local venue but we should that, we should mention that as indie as it seems the iphone um application ecosystem is very much a closed ecosystem and it's yes. big business and we it is on strange love live um have had the opportunity to speak to alex sikorinsky twice um in the last year and he's he's the guy who got denied iPhone for his podcaster. iphone podcast application yeah. Yep. Um, only to have them very shortly thereafter develop and put and that, put in 
the same functionality into the iTunes, right. but they and wouldn't the tell him. They yeah. wouldn't tell him what was going on. Right. Um, at least his side of the story. Uh, we're not trying to take sides here, but you know. Um, no, no, and I think that's the benefit of Android, right? I mean, Android still got that. It still has that. If you want to get into the Android market. It's very much like trying to get into the App Store. It's the same thing. If you want to be listed on the official Android Market site, you still have to go through that rigmarole to get listed. But the benefit of Android is you don't have to jailbreak your phone to install other apps. It's open source. So you can install them from wherever you get them. So, yeah, it'll just be interesting. I don't know where it's going to go. So, I, so last one on this theme. Do yeah. you see Android starting to take to to really grow in 09 to start taking mind share from apple and iphone or do you see iphone as a juggernaut uh, what, what what do you see personally uh personally i think iphone's got a lot of good momentum right now and it's really going to take something miraculous to unseat that as quickly as 12 months from now um i think i really you know I really love open source. I mean, I'm not smart enough to to deal with it, but I mean, I love it. And I think I would really like to see Android do well and succeed in that regard. But um, I think it's, you know, much the same way other open source software has gone. It's a really good idea, but popular adoption is very difficult for it to achieve. So I, I said that it was the last on the mobile, but actually, I should, <laughs> but he I should, lied. No, I should he say because we teeth. we mentioned Ed Baraski's post, and this is yeah. one of the areas that he um, he kind of disagreed with, or you know, he, he just said he he did not see mobile, and he gave a couple good reasons why, and one of them was you know the the fact that there are still multiple platforms out there, um, mm-hmm. you know, iPhone, Android, the new up and comer. Um, you know, and the the other, I mean, Nokia has their own platform. Palm is right. still there, although it seems to be, who knows, on life support at this point. We're not sure. Beep, beep. Um, beep, beep. And that was one of his, his questions that he didn't see uh, mobile. He saw that as the problem with mobile. Um, yeah, and I think that he mentioned the kind of geo-geeking angle, too, as something that wasn't really mainstream in terms of the mobile the mobile platform. You know, I don't, it's, it's really, I don't know. I don't have a good prediction in that, in that regard. I mean, I think again, Symbian, the, the Nokia system that Nokia bought is open source now as well. So there's always the potential that, that something may happen there. But what I see happening in Portland is largely iPhone based and maybe Android. I don't see a lot of people saying, oh, I'm going to develop something for the new, new Nokia handset, or I'm going to develop something for Palm. I'm sure there are people out there doing it, but see, I think, go ahead. I kind of wonder if it looks like the same kind of thing that's happened uh, with the majority of computer systems. You've got Macintosh and Macintosh has their own system and they do their thing their way. Then you've got the Windows Media, and they do things, the Windows Media, I mean, it, that's all their own thing, right? Microsoft yeah. does their own yep. thing, and they've yep. pretty much taken over everything that's not Macintosh, except then you have the Linux and the open source. And I, I, I kind of see that there's going to be that same, there's going to be the Apple, there's going to be, you know, the iPhone, the i, whatever. You just brought then up Windows Mobile. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, and that, was, be, that was another comment. Because they can dump yeah. a whole lot of money into it. They yeah. have the funding in the deep pockets yeah. to really yeah. put that. And I think it's unfortunately going to bury some of the, at least for a while, not permanently, I hope, I think it's going to bury some of the less funded um, mobile systems. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. you, because that's what happens. Because it's right. not as attainable to the average user or to the layman who doesn't know what they're doing. Or they're going to acquire one, like they or, will acquire, yes, or they'll buy it. Yeah, they'll acquire Research in Motion or something and own the BlackBerry. Well, you know, it, it, something like that. Will a, a, a hungry developer is going to go where market share is, right? Correct. Right. When you're, I mean, right. okay. Now we're know. all done with mobile. Okay. Enough mobile. Yes. I, I actually Finally. one of the comments that I read because I get the last word. Damn it. Um, one of the <laughs> comments that I read uh, that I thought was very appropriate, and then I've had the conversation with this person before. Was Betsy Richter pointed out uh, that that old media is pretty much going the way of the dodo. 
Yeah. Those were yeah, not her words. Agree. Those were mine. <laughs> I think we I think we continue to see that even in our small kind of media microcosm of Portland that like there are few there are few people in traditional media who get it um, and get really understand where things are going. Um, you know, we've already mentioned KGW, um, Stephanie Strickland, and Aaron Weiss. Like, clearly get it. They understand what's happening. I think they're moving in the right direction. I've been really happy. Um, I just wanted to mention, I've been really happy that Mike Rogaway at the Oregonian has kind of started yes. um, a positive spin section on his on his blog. Like instead of just focusing weekly on the, you know, all the dour things happening in the tech scene, he also does something called looking. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know, it's good stuff. And I think he's kind of, you know, he gets it. Um, but there are very few. And well, and, you know, you had Steve Woodward on. Unfortunately, he gets it, but he's no longer with traditional media. Yeah, I think he gets gonna, it, but I, I worry sometimes that the people who get it are going to move along to something else because it's, it's like they're afraid, you know, they don't want to go down with the ship. I agree wholeheartedly. I think what you're going to see is a bunch of, you know, this whole new kind of crop of of you know professionals moving to being like um shoot now i'm gonna space his name technologizer um i got the chance to speak on a panel with him at the the silicon forest uh venture thing anyway he was a professional media he was the editor in chief of like PC mag or one of those like, you know, old school technology magazines. And he just, he quit and started his own blog and, you know, he's super successful there. It's called technologizer, but um, I think you're going to see more and more of that happening, or you're going to see those types of people wooed away by bloggers who have been successful and are expanding their staffs in that regard. I have to say one of my, in this Vain. One of my most humorous moments of 2008 was when we were at uh, WordCamp, and I was looking around at the the swag swag they had laying around, and next to all of the little WordPress buttons was a stack of magazines, hard copy magazines, and I can't remember the name of I think it was called Podcaster or something, but it was a podcasting magazine, <laughs> but it was nice. in print, and I was just like, God, oh yeah. my God. Make a podcast out of that or, you know, make a blog, do something that's I couldn't believe. I was, and I took one to read through because I was like, oh, helpful hints. But why on earth is it printed? Why, why am I touching this now? I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think you'll, there's still kind of that, um, again, that's, you know, that's more a traditional media kind of play on Mm -hmm. things. And, you know, I think we, are, um, yeah, but that's uh, you know that, that that's that I think that's effectively died at the end of this year. I mean, isn't it PC Magazine? Didn't they finally shutter yeah, their print that was edition? The, yeah, I mean, it was like you know, I mean, uh, you know, I that's how I got into this game. I started picking up PC Magazine in the eighties, right, and yeah, reading it cover yeah, yeah. to cover, right. I mean, totally. There, there was no World Wide Web, or you know, um, right. You know, you'd read Peter Norton and these guys and go, oh, so that's what's inside of this box, you know. Um, uh-huh. But I think I think that's just a given. And I, w- I was going to mention that the, um, is it the Pew Research um, yep. that just came out uh, just this week and said that uh, everyone's starting to get pretty much getting their news on the, the Internet uh, versus uh, in print now? Yeah, yeah. Actually, Marshall wrote up an article yeah. on that on that report that said, um, yeah, it was at least the the most trusted news source, and and more people were going there for for that kind of information than print media. Yeah, I think you know, I think Betsy's absolutely right, and Betsy has been in the business long enough to right. to see things yeah. that we're not even seeing, Correct. you know, and and uh, I she totally knows what's happening. So I. Uh, It'll be interesting to see what happens around Portland, though, because, I mean, by and large, as as well as the Mercury does, we're a one-paper town, and it, it'll be interesting to see what happens um, if this, you know, if this slide continues to what will happen to our, our well, media. Well, is that your primary fear? Because I'm seeing, what, three or four... 
Now they're they're not hard news blogs, but you have RPDX and yep. PDX Pipeline blog. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the Silicon Florist that's covering the tech scene, and mm-hmm. um, I have to read that. You one. Know, <laughs> um, and there's several several uh, blogs that are just uh, I think is it Neighborhood Notes, and there's there's others that yeah. you can go find. Yeah. That you can find yep. what's going on. And neighborhood locally. neighborhood blogs are cropping up all over right well done neighborhood blogs are actually cropping up all over it used to be you know a bunch of crappy little neighborhood blogs that someone that doesn't leave their basement writes for um, right but people as the technology gets easier to use and becomes more prevalent i think more people are using it more people are getting out there and actually doing something for their neighborhood yeah yeah well, and part of it for me is just nostalgic I mean, quite frankly, you know, I'm a, I was an English major in college. I was, you know, I worked at the town paper, that kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. like, I have a certain appreciation for what it did. Like, I love the the cell would be, even if it just, you know, reports on car wrecks and, you know, <laughs> I like obituaries. I mean, I, I love the cell would we be. We will have to get and, Eric Norberg someday to come on <laughs> yeah, the podcast. That's just a good idea. I know Eric. It's nice, just nice Edwin. Guy. When they changed Multnomah Village Post to like Southwest Portland News, I was like so disappointed Aww. that that those kind of things were happening. So it's you know, it's going to go away. It just and and it's not necessarily a, a terrible thing to the world of news that that stuff goes away. But there's something um, just from a nostalgic standpoint right. where I'm like, there's something there that has value. It's just been so you know watered down by years and years of um, corporate gunk that that it's not really what it once was. But the but the community blogs and the team blogs are not uh, are not um, 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 you don't see them as um, as uh, fitting some of that void. I mean, I do for me. I do for me. I just don't for the general populace at this point. Like I still think we're on the leading edge of those kind of things. Right, they're not like there I, yet as far as reporting. You know what? I got to say, my mom and dad and my grandmother and and my, you know, other non-hip members of my family, not that I'm calling my those particular people, but so many people in my family mm-hmm. use the internet as their primary source of information. Mhm. That I have to believe that it, it's not just us. I would agree. I just think that I wonder what publications they're reading online. Like, are they? Read, do you think they're reading RPDX, or do you think they're more likely to well, read not like in an Portland, Oregon? Well, okay, but case in point, let's just say they were. Like, I'd still see those people going to like an Oregon Live or a KGW dot com as opposed Correct. to. RPDX or right. or neighborhood notes or something, and I think that's going to change. And and you know I read, I mean RPDX is my local news source. Quite frankly, I I rarely read the I read Mike Rogoy's blog and the Oregonian. Um, you know that's about it. And and I read neighborhood notes all the time because I think those guys are doing a great job. And um, those those are my news sources. I just remain hopeful that that they'll continue to gain the following, um, and really come into their own because they're doing a really um, amazing service for the for the community, and they're much better reporting when it comes right down to it. I mean, I'm more a fan of Gonzo journalism than traditional journalism. I'd like there to be a little personal aspect to what's going on, and you know, a little complaining or happiness about about the news at hand and the you know the neighborhood blogs and the kind of rpdx gang give that kind of insight that that a more like dispassionate objective report doesn't and that, i think that's what i like about um stephanie strickland's mm-hmm. show as well is that you know she's really she's real on that thing it's like she'll screw up or she'll like you know kind of ad lib and and it's more the format is more blog like it's more there's more of her in that show yeah. than kind of the dispassioned reporter i agree i there's only so much impartial talk that i can take yeah yep exactly. even if even if you're you know even if i completely disagree with your take on the situation i would almost always rather hear someone's opinion with the facts and and see what it is that they're going through to bring it to me than just 
This is what happened at 6.02 in the morning. Yep. I don't know. That's yep. what I like, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> You're a freak, Dr. Normal. Kind of the Huntley Brinkley kind of feel to it. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, a little Cronkite in there. Yeah. So moving on. Wait, Walter Cronkite. To Dead. S- yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> Dead or alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, if you were listening to uh, previous week's show, Ed Bradley is indeed yeah. dead. Um, okay. Not, do we have to remind me Moving of that? On. It's so sad. Uh, s- In 2009, there will be the robotic yes. head of Ed Bradley delivering okay, oh, yeah, these okay. straight to me. <laughs> we're getting there. The cold medicine is kicking in. Uh, <laughs> social web front. Um, yeah. Anything there. Or is it just yeah, all going to die? Is it going to implode? No, no, no. I think, <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> I think what you're going to see changing is what the um, hell's going on with Facebook? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Facebook. How many I think users Facebook, a month? Yeah, Facebook is six hundred. Six hundred. Uh, is it six hundred thousand a day? It's some ridiculous <laughs> number. Like it's like unbelievable how many people join Facebook, but. Um, Again, if you look at the bell curve, I think Facebook has kind of entered the fat part of the bell curve. Like, they're starting to get these random users who haven't used any social network before. Like, I get all of my high school. Yeah, all the people from high school I know in Twin Falls, Idaho. It's like a population of 25,000 people. Like, everybody I went to high school with is now on Facebook. And I went to high school a long time ago, and they're on, all on Facebook. So, uh, Were they on you know, MySpace before? They were on classmates. Oh, okay. I have to ask you, do people that you don't even remember from high school add you on Facebook? Yes, and I have exact I do, and I have people who are like in the class above me or the class below me uh-huh. who I was friends with who are suggesting all these people from their class that I should add as friends who I have no idea who they are. And now, and, and oh. that's it's called the CIA, <laughs> the NSA. No, I I I, I, I I'm just going to derail this uh, conversation Dr. for a minute. Dr. putting on his little tinfoil hat Yeah, now. I'm going to derail yeah. this conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. for a minute and just say, I think 2009, my one of my predictions, and I don't think it's going to go widespread, but I think that you're going to start seeing stories sometime in 2009 about people going, wait a minute, where's all this information going anyway? And if you don't see those stories, then Dr. Normal will start writing them. No, write no them. I'll be, I'll be, write, I'll be in a ditch post, dead somewhere, just borders, disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I agree. I mean, it's the same thing with Twitter. Like I was saying before, it's like people who don't think Twitter is making money by selling mm-hmm. information to people who want it right now are high. They're they're <laughs> definitely selling it, to, and and that's what's going to be some of their funding. Um, I think that that stuff's all coming to pass. I think if you it, what's going to become really interesting, and we're already starting to see it happen, is that. If you want to, you, you can take this from either the conspiracy theory side or the "Hey, isn't the web rainbows and unicorns?" kind of space. Is that um, things like OpenID and distributed social kind of applications are just exacerbating that whole thing? So now, not only can um, you know when I, when I so for instance, Facebook or Twitter can only tell what I'm doing when I'm on Facebook or Twitter. Mm-hmm. With OpenID, my OpenID provider can tell where I log in, when I log in, what I, how long I stay there, how often I go there. Um, you know, those kind of aspects of it, which is great from a usability standpoint that I can just have one thing and and be able to log into all these other areas. Facebook Connect going to do exactly the same thing. Now Facebook will know what you're doing when you're outside the walled garden or where you're logging into or what friends are important to you on what networks and, and all that kind of thing. And, and yeah, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of potential bad that could happen there. Um, there's also a lot of benefit to the user base about what can happen there. And, and the majority of people who I talk to who adopt those kind of technologies know full well that, they, you know, they have the, like I think um, that there it might is have no been, privacy on the web. Yeah, I think Kaviton might have been even. Yeah. You know, privacy is dead. Don't I even think try he and said think that on privacy. this show? Yeah, yeah, because it's like it's not. Re- it's a it's a figment of your imagination. It's that you know you need to just get used. You get it. Get used to living 
without the semblance of privacy, which you've probably never actually had. Well, if you have a credit card or a few credit cards in exactly. bank Exactly. If you've ever bought beer on a debit card, you're on some FBI list. So, you know, if you really want to get conspiracy <laughs> well, theories... talk about tinfoil it, hats there, Rick. Yeah. I, don't <laughs> I can, get, I can get really talking deep. talking to you, sweetie? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not right now. Was it, uh, uh, was it uh, but, Old English 40 or... <laughs> Yeah, when I, somehow after I bought ammunition and then the <laughs> the, the malt um, liquor, yeah, exactly. They showed up at my door. I don't know why, uh, but I think you know Portland's got uh, to to bring it back to kind of the Portland side on that on the social stuff is um, with Open ID and with the fact that the dupe uh, brought Chris Messina and Will Norris on board with the DSO project. Um, that's another thing in 2009 that you're really going to see happening in the Portland area, this, this idea. And, I, and again, I think, you know, Kavitin thinks about this more than any 20 people I know. So he has some really good ways to kind of phrase it. But the idea that um, you won't go to a particular site to be social, the entire web will be your social network that, that your social network will follow you around or you will follow them around wherever they go. And I think people and, are just starting to understand the importance of that where you're on Twitter and suddenly, you know, you have all the people you follow on Twitter and then you go over to Facebook and, oh, where are my friends? Yeah. But they're they're gone. But you're seeing that change. And it's starting time. to, I mean, that's yeah. going to be beneficial. It's going to be both beneficial and difficult because I have, I have friends that separate themselves uh, on different, like some of them have friends on MySpace and family on Facebook, and it's kind of the, the you know secret life of right. of people, and that's yeah. not going to be as easy to maintain at some point. It's, no, no, it's, it's not just the friends though. It's like um, I think in two thousand and nine, as we go on here, it's like, well, here's all my friends, and here's these people from high school, and who are all these people too? Yeah. What what are all these? And these are not people i mean they're um advertising bots marketing folks yeah you know right. Right. i mean you must have your share of followers on twitter and on you know potentially on facebook that are that are purely um you know ad people I mean, i'm marketing. sure jenny 6927 is a real person and she's exactly really quite kind to me <laughs> You know, she's, she dresses with those, a little with those, scantily. With those boobies, how could she not be kind yeah, to you? Yeah, exactly. She seems trustworthy <laughs> and transparent. But, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of writing, you know, about, you know, how companies need to adopt the social web and what to do and how, you know, I just see that in, in yeah, 09. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's totally going to become something that, like any other media outlet we've had previously, is going to be polluted well, it's the Eventually. junk mail of its time, right? We're talking about right. using a credit card. You use your right. credit card. All of a sudden, you open up your mailbox, and here's all these, yeah. you know, all your junk mail. You're going to be dragging along your Twitter and your Facebook junk mail um, along with you. Dr. Norman, right? yep. speaking of junk mail, <laughs> I think our shredder is broken. Oh, bummer. <laughs> That's unrelated. But in 2009, I predict that the Chaos household will be buying a new shredder. Great. <laughs> Lovely. And new tinfoil hats. Yeah. I think I might so, just take my Vidoop helmet and line it with tinfoil. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. See? And Vidoop is a perfect tie-in. So I, I was going to say, <laughs> like, you know, the, the open ID and DSO stuff, I think we really need to watch. We really have um, a good chance of this whole open web kind of idea. So mm -hmm. we've had this open source stuff which Portland's really been known for. And that is things like operating systems and applications and, you know, things that are built um, using open source ideals that are, that are kind of core or function, you know, core functions to computers or, or mobile handsets or what have you. And then there's this additional layer on top that's the open web, which is things like OpenID or OAuth or, you know, other things, the identity in the browser or um, those kind of things that have really been informed by the whole open source ideal 
they're just they, it just happens to be open source occurring on the web and i think you know given how prevalent open source has been in portland we have a really good chance to make you know i always kind of like to claim that portland's the hub of open id um and and that kind of stuff but i think we really have a good chance in 2009 to to solidify that position and we'll see some more cool stuff coming out of jan rain and and the dupe um jan rain which just signed a big deal with a uh, major recording studio i'm trying to it's one of the, i think it's one of the geffen ones i can't recall off the top of my head but um it, it, we'll start to see more more activity in that regard and because people like people companies like google microsoft facebook well not facebook yet but myspace you know are starting to adopt the open id mindset um, well but we that's have... that's the question though i mean facebook has facebook connect i mean wh right. where do you see that going in 2009 with facebook connect mm -hmm. you know is it complementary with open id or um i mean it seems yeah. like right now it's yeah. kind of two camps they're all talking be... they're all the yeah. same Go to the same places and they all talk together. So they do, and they're all down in. You By know, talking, I mean literally talking. I don't mean. Yeah, yeah. They were all at the week before Christmas. They were all at Dig um, headquarters talking about you know what they're doing with open web kind of stuff. They had a meetup there that a bunch of different um, companies I, showed up to to kind of talk I guess, about. That I guess stuff. what I'm asking in your mind, who wins? Um, I don't know. Um, I think right now what. Uh, what Facebook Connect is to the web, it, you know, to take the analogy to kind of a web 1.0 world, Facebook Connect's kind of the hotmail of <laughs> the connecting Oh, I strategy. remember hotmail. Remember when that was like so easy, I could suddenly, I don't have to have an email client, I can suddenly have a web-based client. And I it, have it's hotmail. That, it's that kind of ease <laughs> of use that Facebook Connect introduces. Hotmail isn't necessarily, I mean, more people are probably on Gmail now than Hotmail. Does but Hotmail even it's exist that, anymore? <laughs> yes, Hotmail exists. exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They, I think they call it MSN Live or something. Yeah, it now, is, but I, mean, it's it's still, I don't like it when they change things on me. It's still around in some form. But I think, I think what you see is Facebook has done a really good job of saying the user doesn't care how they're connecting. They just want to connect easily, and they've yeah. kind of laid this layer of Chrome on top of the on top of the connection strategy, and that's definitely going to do well because it's making things so much easier. But it's also going to force OpenID, um, you know, Google Friend Connect, other technologies like that to move faster and and build more user friendly systems for that kind of thing. So I don't know that I don't know that, you know, Facebook's won by any chance, but I think they've definitely moved raised the bar and that people are going to have to compete with that because it is really easy to implement their stuff. The problem is that um, it's, you know, not widely available. They still kind of it's it's been released, but they still there's still kind of a gating mechanism there whereas like a Google Friend Connect anyone could implement it today. You guys could have Google Friend Connect on Strange Love Live today if you wanted to. We don't um, like friends. So there's some of those there's there's some of those things going on. Okay, well we it's time for us to wrap it up. We're coming okay. to the end of our evening, but I want to know from each of us one brief thing that we haven't mentioned, one brief thing you think is going to go on in 2009. Something Who's shocking. Starts? Something Sh shocking. Think of McLaughlin Group S. Yeah, just give us mm -hmm. a, you know, give us your your, your best one. Or just Ooh. Um, well, my best one, and I, I, but I've used this one before, so it's not shocking. <laughs> I think... Um, wrong! Scott, <laughs> Scott, you're wrong! Scott Kavitan's Bacon Geek. Oh, is gonna yeah. Knock it out of the park. That's my big one. The other, the one that I think is kind of shocking, I think you're going to see a major acquisition from one of the Portland area companies like a Jive or a Splash, like they're going to be acquired, like a Jive or a Splashcast or one of these yeah. mobile developers that we've talked about are going to be acquired by a major corporation. And that's going to kind of change the flavor of the kind of independent Portland tech scene. Who's going to acquire? Is it going to be Microsoft? Do you think I, um, I, I asked that? You know who who's going to be on a buying spree next year? I would think from a from if it were somebody like a Jive that was being acquired, I'd see a, a competitor to Microsoft because Jive positions directly against SharePoint from Microsoft. So I would see it being like a 
Oracle or an IBM or a Google or somebody who's trying to position them as a, themselves against a Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Um, for a splash cast, somebody like that, I would think it'd be a big media company. They've been doing a lot of work in, um, you know, big, uh, both big recording artists, and now they've signed a deal with Hulu to distribute their stuff. Um, if it's one of the mobile development companies, I could easily see a traditional gaming company getting heavy into the mobile space by acquiring a bunch of companies. So like a Sega or a Nintendo or um, you know Sony uh, acquiring a bunch of these mobile app developers to really hit the mobile gaming pretty heavy. So a big so. acquisition of a Portland company. Is yep. in our future. Yep. Dr. Yep. Normal, what what do you think for 2009? Oh, I've been reading and thinking and contemplating. Um, specific to this area, to Portland? Anything you want. Interpret it any way you want. Um, I think we, you know, we, we already touched on this a little bit. I do think that the community will continue to grow and interact. Um, that's not a big surprise. I think um, I think uh, I think beer and blog will continue to survive and thrive along with the various you know star camps whatever you know place your your camp there um, especially as we get into economic time you know the issues in bad economic times and large companies I think hopefully more people from larger companies that aren't connected into the social networking world are going to get a clue and actually start networking um, a bit as well. I'm already seeing that a little bit now. People are starting to go, "What is this Twitter? What? Do, what is you know? What are these things?" Um, so that's that. That's pretty much overall what I see. All right, and my big prediction. I have two. One. Very quick, I think that the cable media is starting to go out, and I say that only because I'm a, I'm a cable addict. I love my television, and uh, in 2009, I'm getting rid of my cable, and we'll be lo- relying on, uh, yeah, on on just normal broadcast. Don't and, have to and, pay that bill And anymore. the internet to get my television junk, and I also predict that we will see all of you here next year, which is actually just next week, for the special. Uh, best of 2008 Strange Love Live podcast, which will be hosted by just Dr. Normal and I. No special guest. And there will be more information on that coming the next week. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to Rick. Absolutely, yeah. Both your, your, you know, Aaron Hockley presented photo self sitting in your studio and you sitting at home. I'm sorry that you couldn't make it actually to our home tonight, but I'm really glad that we got the chance to talk to you. As I always am. And... Thank you to all of you for joining joining us tonight. I hope you've had a wonderful 2008 and uh, have a very wonderful and safe, please, please safe uh, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day for 2009. See you later. That, that was the mommy in me talking, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Have a good night, everybody.